When you first encounter optimization problems like the ones we've introduced, it can seem a little bit daunting, especially if you don't have a lot of practice with the underlying math tools. So let me do a little bit more practice, especially for those of you who are struggling on the quizzes that are attached to the earlier modules. First, let's ask, what is it that we're trying to do? We're trying to get to the highest possible indifference curve, given the budget that we face. This problem, just like most problems in economics, have two components. One is that there's a constraint. There's something that keeps us from being able to do anything we want. And second, there's an objective. There's something we're trying to achieve. We're trying to get to the highest utility level in this case. And problems like this always have the same general form. We try to maximize something by choosing something subject to the constraint that we can't just do anything we want. So we're trying to maximize an objective. In this case, utility. Subject to a constraint, in this case, it's the budget constraint. But in general, we'll have an objective here and the constraint here. And then we just need to figure out what is it that we're actually choosing. In our case, the objective is to maximize utility. The constraint is the budget. And the things we're trying to choose are x1 and x2, the consumption bundle. Once you've figured out what your objective is and what your constraint is, you can set up this Lagrange function because you'll set it up in exactly the same way no matter what the problem is, as long as you know the objective and the constraint. So the Lagrange function is just the objective first, in this case utility, plus lambda times the constraint, in this case the budget. Now the, when we put the budget in here, it'll be collecting all the terms of the equation to one side. But this is the general way of setting up a Lagrange function. Put the objective here, put the constraint here. And 90% of the battle is to figure out how to set up the Lagrange function. If you know how to do that, the rest is just math. Now, I did introduce in the first module a different way of solving for this bundle, but it's a much less general way. I was just trying to give you some intuition as to why it is that we set derivatives to zero. But the much more general way that will work in many more circumstances is this Lagrange method. So now suppose that our utility was given by this function. So the underlying map of indifference curves is represented by this utility function, which turns out to be quasi-linear. And suppose that your income is 1,000, the price of good 1 is 20, and the price of good 2 is 10. We have all the ingredients now to set up the Lagrange function. So this Lagrange function that will allow us to solve for this bundle starts with the objective. The objective is to maximize utility, and utility is given by this. So we start by putting in 200 times x1 to the 1 half plus 10 times x2. Then we're going to have a second term that's preceded by lambda, and that's our constraint with all terms collected to one side. All the ingredients for the budget constraint are contained right here in the income, the prices for goods 1 and 2. So what is that budget constraint? Well, spending, my spending on good 1, 20 times x1 since the price of good 1 is 20, plus my spending on good 2, 10 times x2, has to be equal to my income. There is my constraint. That's the equation of this budget line. And so we want to put that behind the lambda in parentheses with all the terms collected to one side. So you could subtract those two terms, or you could subtract this from, bo from both sides. I always subtract this from both sides. 
So I get 1000 minus 20x1 minus 10x2. Okay, so when you don't get right answers on these problems, the first thing you might have done wrong is set up this Lagrange function incorrectly. But once you know how to do it, how it's tied to objectives and constraints, it should be pretty simple. The rest is just math. We need to take derivatives of the Lagrange function with respect to everything we're choosing and with respect to lambda. So here we're choosing x1 and x2. So we need to take the derivative of the Lagrange function with respect to x1, derivative with respect to x2, and then the derivative with respect to lambda. The second type of error that students often make early on is that they don't take partial derivatives correctly. And that's probably because you're rusty on taking partial derivatives or you've never seen it before. But remember that when you're taking a partial derivative, the only place you have to pay attention to is where the variable you're differentiating with respect to actually appears. So x1 appears here and it appears here. Everything else is not going to be relevant because everywhere else we either have a number or a number times multiplied multiplied by a variable that we're holding fixed, which makes it just a number. So the derivative of 10 with respect to x1 is just 0. The derivative of 10x2 with respect to x1 is also just 0 because x2 is just treated as a number. So all we have to look at is where do we see x1? We see it in two places. The derivative of this with respect to x1 is 1 half times 200, which gives us 100 times x1 to the minus 1 half. And then we have a second x1 term multiplied by lambda, that's minus 20 lambda times x1. Derivative of that with, re with respect to x1 is just equal to minus 20 lambda. Then we differentiate with respect to x2. So all we have to do is find where does x2 appear. It's here and here. The derivative of this with respect to x2 is just equal to 10. The derivative of minus 10 times lambda times x2 with respect to x2 is just minus 10 lambda. And then when we differentiate with respect to lambda, we just get back the constraint. We just get back 1000 minus 20x1 minus 10x2. So first step, solve for these partial derivatives, then set the equations to zero. These are called our first order conditions of the maximization problem. And now we have three equations and three unknowns, lambda, x1, and x2. And we try to find the easiest way to solve that system of three equations. In this case here, there's a particularly easy way because the second equation is just in terms of lambda, so we can immediately so solve for lambda with the second equation. We take this to the other side, get 10 is equal to 10 lambda. Divide by 10, so lambda is equal to 1. Once we know lambda is equal to 1, we can substitute that into the first equation. And so then this is going to be equal to 20. So I'm going to write this term without the negative exponent. So I'm going to write it as 100 divided by x1 to the 1 half. Right. Remember, a negative exponent just means it appears in the denominator. And then I'm going to take this to the other side, substituting 1 in for lambda. So that's equal to 20. Now I'll multiply through by x1, get x1 to the 1 half is equal to divide through by 20. So 100 divided by 20 gives us 5. Square that and x1 is equal to 25. I've just solved for this. I've just solved for the x1 component of the optimal consumption bundle. Now that we have x1, we know what x2 is going to be because we just have to use the budget constraint, which is what this third condition gives you back. So 1000 minus 20 times x1, but x1 we already know is 25, so 20 times 25 is equal to 10x2. 20 times 25 is 500, 
a thousand minus 500 is 500 so we get 500 is equal to 10 x2 or x2 is equal to 50 and we've solved for the optimal bundle all pretty easy if we know how to set up the Lagrange function and we know how to take partial derivatives and then solve for this system of three equations and three unknowns so this is one scenario I'd like to cover one more that will clarify something else that showed up in the module so suppose that instead of the price of good 1 being 20 and the price of good 2 being 10 we have the price of good 1 being 10 and the price of good 2 being 20 with income still equal to a thousand so we keep the utility function the same we keep income the same we just reverse the two prices what might happen now what will be different well we again want to set up the Lagrange function Lagrange function what we're trying to maximize first that's my utility function 200 times x1 to the 1 half plus 10 x2 plus lambda times the constraint well what is the constraint now 1000 is equal to the price of good 1 times x1 plus the price of good 2 times x2 so I'm going to collect all the terms to one side so we get 1000 minus 10x1 minus 20x2 now we take the partial derivatives just as we did over here partial derivative Lagrange with respect to x1 it's still going to have that first term 100 times x1 to the minus 1 half plus lambda times uh, plus the, the, the second term which will be different now because we have a different price so lambda times 10 times x1 take the derivative of that with respect to x1 we'll get minus 10 lambda so instead of the 20 lambda we have a 10 lambda take the derivative with respect to x2 and we get 10 just as we did before and then the derivative of minus 20 times x2 times lambda with respect to x2 will give us minus 20 lambda so instead of minus 10 lambda we have minus 20 lambda so those are our first two equations let's set those equal to zero we can again solve for lambda only this time lambda isn't going to be one lambda is going to be equal to 10 divided by 20 or one half so when we substitute that in here and we do this we get um, 100 divided by x1 to the one half is equal to 10 times one half of five so now we get multiply both sides by one half by x to the one half so x to the one half is equal to 100 divided by 5 which is 20 so x this is all x1 x1 is going to be equal to 20 squared which is 400 now we use that final equation which is going to be exactly the same since we have an x1 we can figure out what the x2 is going to be so we get 1000 minus well, we have to use our budget constraint 10 times x1 x1 is 400 minus 20 times x2 is equal to 0 or I can just write it like this 10 times 400 is 4000 a thousand minus 4000 is minus 3000 is equal to 20x2 which means x2 is equal to minus 150 well wait a second can we have a negative consumption value of x2 that doesn't make any sense so what's going on here what's going on is that we have indifference curves that are crossing the axes so 
when I have a budget constraint. The math is extending the budget constraint to go into, into these other directions. And it tries to find a tangency. And so we, if we have indifference curves that cross the axes, it's finding a tangency here, where this is minus 150, and this is 400. But that's not a consumption bundle that's actually economically feasible, because we can't consume negative amounts of something. What's the real solution? Well, the real solution is we can't get to this indifference curve. It lies outside of our budget set. The highest possible point we can get to is this one. But here, mathematically, this is crossing that line. So it's not a tangency. So the Lagrange method didn't find it. Instead, it gave us an answer that didn't make any sense. But whenever we see that, we know that the actual answer is that whatever is negative is going to be zero. So the actual answer is that x2 is zero. And all of our income is going to be spent on good one. Everything is being spent on good one. Since the price of good one is 10, and my income is 1,000, I'm going to consume 1,000 divided by 10, or 100 units of x1, and zero of x2. So in both of these cases, we use the same utility function. But in one case, we got what we call an interior solution, which was the correct solution. But if the math ends up giving you a negative answer, then you know you're the corner solution. You're going to consume zero of that good and just spend everything you have on the other good. But the key to all of this is to be sure you know how to set up the problem. If you have the Lagrange function, and then you know the basic steps. You'll either end up with something like this or end up with something like this. And you can solve for the actual optimal consumption bundle.